So welcome to the sixth day of our discussion. And uh, so far we have been discussing about feelings. And so we were discussing about feelings like happiness in the first place. And then this uh, feelings like despair, anger. And today we are going to speak about fear. But before that, this is the sixth day of this discussion and I promised you to finish it by about five days. However, it got dragged. And I think I might need a seventh day but let's make the seventh day optional because seventh day is the Sabbath day. Even God, after creating the world, he took a uh, he took a holiday. So I'm going to take a holiday on the seventh day, and I'm opening the forum for you to ask me questions. Also, during this entire series, I've been telling you a message in a cryptic form. Now it is cryptic, not because I want to make it hard for you. It's the nature of that message. It's cryptic. I don't know if we have figured it out or not, but let's figure out uh, that during the uh, frequent uh, the question and answer session. However, during the last session, I will also take a couple of minutes, 10-15 minutes, and to tell you a short term and a long term plan of what you need to do for the rest of the life after this discussion series. So then you won't be needing me. That's good enough for you to have your own or select your own path and pursue your own path. So having said that, I also believe that action over contemplation is very important. Buddhism is not a religion or a practice where you only try to understand it by reading a book or try to contemplating uh, thinking this is what I should be doing. But the more important thing is really getting into the business and doing it. So what I'm trying to essentially do is trying to teach you, you guys swimming over Zoom. You know, if, if I try to uh, teach you swimming or zoom, of course you would know a lot of things. You would know the breaststroke, you would know the freestyle backstroke. But however, the real actual swimming is when you are outside in that pool or in a um, in a river or a, a lake. So I don't want this discourse to be like that. You have to swim outside. So let's figure out how we do that. Also, I was trying to sort of change your paradigm on uh, how you think about life, your approach to life. Also, what you think of emotions and how do you respond to incidents and uh, your entire interactions with uh, the four P's, people, places, pastimes and uh, possessions, which is essentially your life. So I've been trying to change your paradigm on certain things. So then we figured out that feelings, emotions, ideas, beliefs, paradigms, opinions, whatever you call it, they to a great extent depend on the subjective knowledge we have, the subjective knowledge. Now why do I say that uh, the knowledge is subjective? Knowledge itself is very incomplete. Why? Because there is a way that we acquire knowledge. Our acquiring of knowledge happens through a, happens through a set of equipment and uh, a process through, uh, processing uh, is processed through our mind equipment. These equipment are flawed in nature, they are limited in nature. Classic example is that uh, out of the entire range of uh, electromagnetic spectrum, we can only feel or we can only sense, perceive a little strip of visible light range. Uh, same goes to the ear, nose, tongue, haptic sensation. It's always a small strip of the entire knowledge which is available and our mind cannot fathom everything. For example, we cannot simply fathom how many drops of water would there be in the Lake Ontario or in the Pacific Ocean. We simply cannot fathom them. You know, we cannot fathom uh, what is 4D, what is 5D. So there's a limitation in the equipment and the central processing unit that we have in our system. So the knowledge we acquire essentially is, is not the ultimate reality. This is also another philosophical debate that uh, can we really understand the world in reality, can we really understand the reality uh, in full or are we just uh, understanding a fraction of reality. I will leave it up to you but uh, out of what I said, just, in, just think about it, can you know the ultimate reality about this world, about this ecosystem, about people or are we just uh, getting a small bit of information and we are basing our paradigms, our beliefs our opinions, our emotions, our feelings on that. And uh, apart from that fundamental error of our equipment, 
we have another major concern another issue i would say that is we cannot see both side at once now why do i what do i mean by uh, the both side at once say for example i am here you cannot see me right now as dead or alive at the same time you would either see me as alive or you would see me as dead do you get it there's this nature in this world that nature always has two sides it's like a coin it has heads and tails however we only can observe a single side we cannot observe the quantumness of the nature we only observe the singularity of the nature i will explain it to you further now buddha at one point he performed a miracle by any means buddha is not a magician he was a normal human being as you and i only difference is that he figured out certain things other than that he was not a magician however there's this uh, miracle that uh, he supposedly performed which is called the yamaka pratiharya now the word yamaka in pali means twin or dual so it's it's the twin or the dual miracle so in books later on it says that uh, buddha at at once he from his uh, one hand he he uh, created uh, fire and in the other hand he created water so he could emit water and fire both at the same time out of his body i don't think that's uh, that's real because uh, if buddha is a human being i don't think he can uh, emit water and fire at the same time but there's a more deeper meaning to that it's probably the guy who wrote the book uh, mistook it for magic and uh, you know all that miracle uh, stuff that uh, religious leaders do but the greater message that you find if you dwell, uh, if you go deep down into the discourse of buddha and the various expositions various uh, uh, various things that we find in the pali canon various sutras we find in the pali canon for example the yamaka sutra the yamaka vagga which means that buddha is showing the dualistic nature of the world how the world sits in a duality and how buddha can see this duality at the same time a normal person would only observe the singularity or the one sidedness of it but buddha sees both sides of it so water and fire which are completely of two natures you know the yin and yang coming together and observing yin and yang together so that is what's meant by this buddha's twin miracle and also very importantly Buddha gives another message that uh, the message of dependent arising or called as dependent origination that is one of the core elements of buddhism i will not go into detail of what dependent arising is but i'll put it in a very simple form how it's explained is that uh, when this exist that comes to be with the arising of this that arises with this when this does not exist that does not exist with the cessation of this this also ceases now that's what uh, buddha has taught in pali as well iti imasmin sati idam hoti with this when this exist that comes to be now i'll give you a practical example of uh, what that really means imagine go back to your classroom when you were a young boy uh, or a girl there are tall people and there are short people now what is really tall and short in world what is the measure end of tall and short we can obviously say well someone who's above 6 feet or 280 meter centimeters is tall or someone is who's below is short but can the tall people exist without the existence of the short people now we see that one exists because of the other and there's an interdependency that is what's called by the dependent arising now uh, i'm taking a crude example of heights into interdependency here but in buddhism it's not really about the heights and the physical shapes and sizes but it's about something very internal something about our mind how our mind perceives duality but we don't really perceive duality we only see the singularity but that singularity cannot exist without a complete inverse of that so that's what uh, this concept means so the good and bad the good in the world exists because there's relative bad in the world the rich exist because there's poor in the world imagine that everyone is equally poor equally poor there won't be a division called rich and poor imagine that everyone is rich in the world 
we won't be able to simply fathom what is richness or which is poorness because everyone is equal so that type of a thing doesn't exist in the world world always exist with this dualistic the duality and since we are not uh, since we are not quantum beings we cannot simply understand this duality we on, always see one side of that so <clears throat> so that is one of the key concepts of buddhism and uh, that is also one of the key issues that we have as human so uh, then we also when you to discussing um things like happiness and in that happiness discussion i also mentioned that happiness always should be accompanied with expectation that pleasure is always associated with desire i said that now pleasure and desire or happiness and expectation also has this dependent origination or the dependent arising happiness cannot exist without expectation um you would uh, can you might think well not always for example what about instantaneous pleasure that we don't have an expectation to have that pleasure but somehow there's some instantaneous pleasure i remember watching this uh, it was on uh, on youtube it was on tv way back in the day it was called just for laughs gags there was this uh, tv series uh, called just for laughs and i remember in uh, one of those uh, episodes there's this funny story a guy is sitting uh, at a restaurant table and then uh, there's a man and a woman who comes and sits in front of that uh, other guy uh, on that same booth and uh, this guy feels that someone is touching his leg and then this guy is this guy gets excited because the woman is also winking at him so he thinks that it's the woman but actually it's not the woman it's the man who's touching uh, the other guy's leg and this guy without knowing that without looking down he gets all excited but the moment that he realizes that uh, it's not the woman it's the man he gets totally embarrassed now that's a funny story simple funny story but my point is that there's no such thing called instantaneous pleasure even to have some form of a pleasure now that touch sensation was a physical sensation it's a, it was a physical stimulus but in order for him to make it a pleasurable thing it has to be based on a woman that he likes you know that concept has to come to his head otherwise it cannot be the same so conceptual pleasure is always attached to expectation based desire we do not do anything in this world we simply do not we uh, exist in this world because we have this continuous pleasure seeking nature that we have and that pleasure seeking nature itself is desire i don't know if what i'm saying today is a little uh, too deep for you or if it's uh, making you uh, more complicated if this whole thing is becoming more complicated because of that but i'll try to put it uh, as simple as possible so the second thing or the third thing is that this happiness is always associated with me i could not simply speak of a happiness without me being there basically what i'm saying is that to have an experience there should be always an experiencer to have an experience our life is an experience we are the witnesses of our own experiences so you need to have someone experiencing that and uh, without something being mine i cannot really enjoy it you know i can only be enjoying something which i like i like so there's two parts in it there's the i part and there's a like part so if you take i you cannot really uh be happy about it like uh, for example if there's something that uh, some other monk likes here and uh, i do not get that pleasure because he likes it it has to be always mine it it's always the it goes the other way around as well i cannot be hurt because of someone else's loss i can only be hurt because of my loss so you see it goes both ways to both emotions so world is dualistic but uh, we operate on the base of singularity hence we are digital beings we are not quantum beings we are not that advanced like quantum physics because quantumness it at the the quantum uh, there is thing called the quantum uncertainty quantum uncertainty means an electron could be or could not be here at the same time now that's quantum uncertainty or if you look at a experiment like schrodinger's cat there's quantum uncertainty but uh, in the real world either i am alive here or i am dead we only observe a singularity so we are digital beings digital means we operate on yes no yes no have 
does not have. So that is the basis that we operate on. So those are the uh, issues that we discussed during the past uh, few weeks. So uh, to summarize it, the limitation of the exp equipment and uh, we cannot see both sides at once. And the other thing is I, me and mine are always there whenever we try to be happy, whenever we try to be angry, sad, whatever, with whatever the feeling, limitation of equipment is there, we do not see both sides of it and that I, me and mine is always there. So when we discuss this uh, range of emotion, emotions, we can also divide this uh, roughly, these emotions into the positives and the negatives. So we know the happy, the euphoric side is the positive side. However, the frustration, the fearfulness, anxiousness, anger, they are the negative sides. So today we are going to speak about, uh, talk about the anger side of it, which is a very close um, emotion to anxiety, uh, to disgust, um, even uh, repulsion. It's really a repulsion. So if you take the physical side of uh, the anger, like we discussed the uh, physical, uh, sorry, physical side of the fear. Sorry, I made a mistake. Physical side of the fear. Like we discussed the physical side of anger the other day, fear is also a very dark, harmful, adrenaline and cortisol uh, based emotion. It uh, Adrenaline and cortisol, cortisol uh, they are both two brain uh, neurotransmitters which increases our heart rate, our blood pressure, our sugar levels and uh, uh, fear is not doing good to, an, to any human being or for an animal for that matter. It's a, it's a good emotion for our survival, if you take that uh, point of view, perspective. However, long-term exposure to fear is always bad for yourself. Long-term anxiety, if someone who has ever had anxiety, he would tell how bad it is. I have uh, met a lot of people who, who, had, who has uh, anxiety disorders and uh, uh, panic attacks. You know, that feeling is never... a uh, uh, easy feeling or uh, enjoyable feeling. People just hate it so much. They hate the the, uh, the fear. So you hate the hate and you hate the fear also. So uh, let's get into deep of what this feeling is like and also you would notice that I'm really trying to explain about your own feelings. So these are not uh, rocket science. These are not uh, um, extraterrestrial ideas these are our own feelings what I'm doing is I'm just trying to put them in a lineup and then try to pinpoint what are the possible issues or what is the reason that uh, this feeling or the emotion came to be how did it uh, originate how do how does it uh, cease so that's what I'm that's that's my job and underneath all these uh, messages there's another message underneath and let's see if we can figure it out uh, at the end of this uh, Q&A. So if you look at the types of fears, to name some of the common fears, we have the fear of sickness. Fear of, um, let's take the fear of sickness that everyone during the last two years, I think the entire world knew what the fear of sickness is, thanks to COVID. Actually, COVID has been a blessing in disguise. A lot of people, I think, started to think a little more spiritual, thanks to COVID. So it showed us how afraid we can be for sicknesses. We have uh, the fear of ghosts as a, as a child, even as an adult, you are afraid of ghosts, spirits. In fact, uh, a lot of people are afraid of the dead. But I find where, where the haunted places are actually the most beautiful places that you can ever be. Personally, I always want to try and test out things. So I, I have made it a point. I have never met a ghost, but uh, I have always been on ghost hunting since I was a kid. In Sri Lanka, I have been to many places right at the, when the midnight clock strikes. Um, I have been to a lot of places where they say there have been uh, murders and uh, it's haunted, etc. In fact, um, I don't think it's haunted here down there in uh, Cambridge. There's this beautiful uh, cemetery called the Mount View Cemetery. I take a walk after our 7, uh, 6.30 to 7 uh, chanting session and I walk all the way down to Cambridge and I cut across the cemetery. I really enjoy the sunset there. It's so peaceful. Where the dead are living, <laughs> that's the most peaceful place that you can be. So a lot of people are afraid of the dead. So you have this innate, uh, or, not, or you have this uh, 
fear of uh, ghosts, etc. What if we take about fears like uh, vampires and uh, uh, zombies, which is pop culture created, but we have the fear of zombies. And if we today we will also take a, a bit of analysis of uh, the movies. The movie industry actually is trying to cater our feelings. It would either cater romance, it would cater fear. Um, you know that's what the, the movie industry does. So if we take the vampire stories, the vampires are always afraid of a few things. They are afraid of garlic, silver, a cross, and uh, uh, sunlight. So those are the things that a vampire would be afraid of. However, if you look at all the spirits available in the world, and uh, the the exorcisms done on these uh, spirits and the possessed uh, people, you would find that it's very much related to the religion you follow. It's as if these spirits, they also have religion. For example, if you go to, uh, if you go to, uh, to a Middle East country, um, they call it the Jaini, Jaini, like Jaini, Jain or something. Uh, so this guy is afraid of the verses of Quran. And if you go to Sri Lanka, those spirits are, they are afraid of the uh, chantings of Buddha, the sutras, the pirit. They are afraid of that. If you come to the Western world, they are afraid of the cross. So you see, these spirits are very much associated with the religion that you follow, or probably they follow. If you again look at the movie movies, I don't know if you have watched this uh, scary movie called The Nun. It, it was a major hit. There was uh, Nun, 1, 2, 3, etc. So this movie Nun, there's this uh, ultimate thing that that uh, possessed spirit uh, fears. That is the blood of the Christ. Now, it fears that blood of the Christ. However, if you take the same blood of the Christ and give it to a Sri Lankan ghost, they wouldn't be scared of that. They would be scared of the of a relic of a Buddha. So you see, there's, uh, that also to be noticed with our fears. And if you look at movies again, there were vampire movies, the original vampire movies, they were afraid of uh, the cross, the silver and uh, all, the, all those. However, with the development of science, there was this other movie called uh, The Blade, I think. Yeah, The Blade. Now this Blade uh, movie, I think it's a Blade movie, that those vampires, they are afraid of UV lights. They have developed it with science and they have made uh, silver bullets and they, have, uh, they are using this EDTA solution. I remember what EDTA from my chemistry days, it's uh, ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. So the vampires are afraid of that also. So they have tried to incorporate uh, science, that belief system. I'm calling science also a belief system. You might uh, wonder why am I calling science a belief system, but let's take that also. So vampires can be afraid of science also, not only religion. So I'm just trying to explain more and more fears. This morning, one of my friends wanted me to take an insurance policy and uh, he has sent me a couple of options. And I was going through the insurance uh, policy and what it covers. It is a fantastic source to find your fears. I only realized that there are so many ways that I could die <laughs> after reading that insurance policy. You know, there's this, that, because they have a cover for everything. So insurance policies, read your insurance policy. You would find that so many fears embedded in that, in that policy. And you also find people who usually make you afraid or want to um, think of uh, think about fears apart from the movie makers are the insurance agents, uh, the astrologers, the fortune tellers, and there's also other people like the politicians. They also want you to be aware of what could kill you or what is harmful for you. And uh, there's also the priests. They talk about fears. So some they address the fears during your lifetime, and uh, people like priests, the category like priests, they tell about the the fears about your afterlife, what could happen to you afterwards. So you are either afraid of your current life or your afterlife. And don't worry, insurance agents have solutions for your current life, politicians have uh, answers for your current life, priests, they have uh, solutions for your afterlife. So you don't have to worry, only thing is that you need to work and uh, get an insurance policy. So again, if we try to come into what are the other type of fears that we encounter, we have security issues, we have insecurity issues financial security, job security, life security, 
and also i'll bring out another point into this that uh, these securities are always it has to do it has something to do with my security my family's security my daughter or son's security my neighborhood security my country's security my world's my uh, earth security my planet system security my nebula security it has so this minus is very interesting my or i or what i call mine does not have a limit it can be as small as a peanut and can be as big as the entire universe it's how you define sometimes what is mine is only my body when i have a rival uh, uh, sibling or a friend but sometimes my is my entire neighborhood or the country if i'm going to if i'm waging a war with another country so you see that my can expand or contract based on uh, your state of mind and the condition however with all these securities it is associated to me my family security my security etc etc and also when we look at these securities or insecurities there is also this ideal or the optimal situation a security is always because there is an ideal or an optimal situation let's call that uh, optimal situation the comfort zone so we have comfort zones and what is insecure is outside this comfort zone so if you look at your comfort zones again i'm sure that everyone understands what a comfort zone is and how you get into comfort zones if you really look at your comfort zones and uh, the other day I, i mentioned that you, you can divide the world into two your physical world and the uh, emotional or the mental sentimental world in the comfort zones also it's 80% psychological 20% physical what do i mean by that now i always put my mind and body into test after coming here to canada i have put my body into test by staying in the extreme cold uh, when it was about uh, 2025 i just uh, went outside and uh, sat and see how long i could stay i walked bare feet all the way down this trail uh, to see if i can really without getting a frostbite if my body can uh, survive actually the body can survive and uh, even yesterday i went uh, to our basement which is very cold and then i was trying to take a cold shower to see if uh, my body can really handle it the body can handle it but usually these things are not in your comfort zone and you do not want to do that thinking that it's hard but let me reassure you again our comfort zones are 80% mental and only 20% physical i'm not saying that there's a physical uh, hard line where you cannot uh, where you can cross there is a physical hard line for example i cannot be probably in minus 80 degrees or when it's minus 30 i cannot uh, stay outside the without proper garments but again there are a lot of things which we don't question because we simply do not want to get out of that comfort zone now it is true to our physical comfort zones it's very true to our mental comfort zones back in the day when i was at university i worked for a adventure company which was a outbound training company and the concept of outbound training is outbound corporate training is actually to expose your team your corporate team into a physically challenging um zone which is outside your comfort zone and the learning is that when you are exposed to that uh, challenging out of the comfort zone environment you will take that something into your workplace so that you will uh, be able to break your mental comfort zones and get out of get out of those mental comfort zones so with fears again this idea of the optimal situation or the ideal situation comfort zone is always there however now although we say that we always swing between like a pendulum between the comfort zone and the out of the comfort zone what does that mean inside the comfort zone we feel cozy we feel safe however it's super boring inside that so we always want to venture out and get out of our comfort zones and to see, seek for thrill so that's what uh, thrill seeking is always about you venture out from your comfort zone and when you venture out you get beaten emotionally or physically then you again return to your comfort zone so we are in a continuous state of change between security and insecurity security versus uh, adventure monotonous versus uh, spontaneous desire over fear 
So you see that uh, again, we sit in a dualistic world where there are two sides to it. But at a given point, we only want to be in a comfort zone or get out of the comfort zone. And there are two drivers. The driver is your fear keeps you within the comfort zone, whereas your desire wants you to take or leap outside that comfort zone and seek uh, pleasure in that. So that's what uh, uh, happens in a comfort zone and how fear affects a comfort zone. However, with a comfort zone, there's this very interesting thing which relates to our previous discussion that comfort zones are always controllable. Now, let's take an air-conditioned uh, house. We know how to con it is conditioned by the very name air-conditioned. We have the control. So we know how to control it. If it's too hot, we can bring down the temperature. If it's too cold, we can increase the temperature. So we have the we know the, the parameters and we can uh, change those parameters and control the outcome. So in a way, if you can remember the last weeks that uh, a comfort zone is a place where you can really set your expectations and those expectations are justified. They are valid expectations. Remember I told you the other day that if we expect an elephant to be inside my fridge, you cannot simply justify that. But if you expect food to be inside your fridge, it is a justifiable expectation. And uh, why? Because you can always control your fridge. You can put stuff in that, take stuff outside. So that expectation is validated. So you also see that uh, within a comfort zone, you have a great mental sense of uh, security. It probably is a wrong uh, sense of uh, uh, security because we understood that our equipment is flawed our knowledge and our understanding and our processing of that knowledge is flawed. So it could be very well a wrong decision. However, we have the mental solace inside that comfort zone thinking it's a comfort zone. So it's not really the actual risk which is which is uh, there, but the, really the mental assurance that you have. Just think about it. And uh, most importantly or most uh, fascinatingly, we always fear the unknown. I'll take another movie example. If you go back to your childhood, you probably remember the remember Casper the Friendly Ghost. Now that boy is never afraid of the friendly ghost because he knows that ghost, Casper the Friendly Ghost. You are always afraid of the ghost that you don't know. If, if someone has uh, uh, lost your loved one, the better half, and that person is a ghost now, like in that uh, famous song, any song, right? Um, if it's your loved one and if that person is a ghost, you are not afraid of him. But if it's some other unknown uh, grandmother who's a spirit now, then you are afraid of that uh, ghost. So you see, you are really more afraid of things that you don't know. When COVID initially happened, a lot of people were very scared. They went into a massive mass panic mode. The entire world shut down. COVID is still there. People are actually getting more COVID sick these days, but no one cares. No one even wears masks anymore. But they are getting more sick actually. If you take the numbers of COVID right now, it would be higher than uh, what it had been in the peak of the pandemic. But you don't even call it a pandemic anymore. It's a controlled uh, version of COVID now. So you see, when you didn't know about COVID, when initially it happened in Wuhan, you were super afraid. But now that you know everything to know about COVID, the genetic makeup, to which age category it bothers most. You know pretty much everything about COVID, so you are not afraid anymore. I remember going into uh, one uh, haunted uh, place in Sri Lanka that's called the Adisham Bangalore. They say it's haunted. It's now a Benedictine uh, church. We stayed uh, a night over there. And uh, that building itself is pretty old, hundreds years, very old, and uh, made out of uh, stone. It's very spooky looking. So there was this little boy who was with us. He was very afraid during the night. And then uh, following the morning when we were having breakfast, he was running everywhere. So I asked him, aren't you afraid now? He said, now it's uh, lit. I mean, there's light all over. It's uh, daytime. I'm not afraid during the daytime. I'm only afraid during the night. Now, it's a, it's a common experience as uh, when we were, even when we were a kid. Probably, I don't know if you are still scared of uh, ghosts and spirits. Probably that's the case. You are always scared of ghosts at night. But why are you more afraid during the night? I'll give you the explanation. When the lights are off, you simply do not know. 
it's uncertain you do not know because you do not have that knowledge from the eye but when the lights are on you know you know where is where what is where and uh, you know the parameters and you have a sense of security that you can control the parameters so you see when you don't know things you become scared i'll give you another example if you have to go to a airbnb and if you have to use the towels there or the bed uh, bed uh, sheets and the uh, the duvet there you will be a little uh, worried that uh, is it a used towel is it a used pillow etc but if it's uh, your own uh, family member who used that pillow or the bed sheet you'll be okay with that i mean it won't be that disgusting as some unknown stranger using it right however your own family member might be having a very bad uh, uh, personal hygiene maybe that stranger has a far better hygiene but still you are afraid why because you do not know so there's even this saying that the unknown devil or the known devil is better than the unknown angel so you see you are always afraid the fear is always associated with not knowing unknown makes us very much afraid night why because we cannot see we do not have that information so uncertainty plays a big role with the fear however you might also notice that uncertainty we also discussed earlier that uncertainty or the unplanability also gives the biggest pleasure also the spontaneous things which happens in our life the surprise birthday parties they are more pleasurable than uh, planned birthday parties if we know how birthday parties planned you know it's not uh, it's not giving us a lot of happiness however when it's unplanable when it's uncertain things are better and things are worse at the same time so you see that there's a uh, the, the two sides of the coin and how these things are linked together and uh, fear is not always negative if as a race as uh, a species if we did not have fear built into us somehow we would have been uh, gone out of this world a long time ago if we didn't know which animal to fear should we fear a deer or a lion if we didn't know the difference if it wasn't uh, built into us we would have been eaten by a lion so fear is not necessarily a bad thing it's a survival uh, instinct it, it's actually for our survival and also when we try to look at how we uh, respond to fear we take two roads the high road or the low road uh, or the fight or the flight so um fear actually is also not a bad thing uh, a bad thing if you look at it because uh, if you look at the society fear is a very important uh, thing that keeps the society intact imagine that uh, people does not care for norms rules or morality if you did not have that compass like the sociopaths we hear of sociopaths like ted bundy etc etc who have been killing people without that uh, inside uh, moral guide or the compass they did not have a fear of doing that they were not afraid of doing that simply because of their uh, wiring was short in their brain their brain chemicals were wrong so they became uh, pathological sociopaths they did not have that element of fear in fact uh, i think it was the world wars that uh, some of the drugs that people used now like uh, methamphetamine people developed those drugs to give it to soldiers so they would not feel fear they would take out that fear making neurotransmitter chemically so that your fear element is gone so you can go on a killing spree you know kill the uh, enemy soldiers and get into places where you usually would not go because you have the fear factor so there are examples like that so you see that fear is not necessarily a bad thing for the the harmony of the society unless we didn't we did not have that uh, fear of uh, norms fear of rules fear of uh, moral code it would be a more a lot more chaotic in this world also we have different fears in different stages of our life let's take uh, if you are a kid your fear is uh, being punished because uh, your, your parent or your teacher would in one way or the other will try to punish you if you don't do something so you would try to get into that good behavior and when you're a teen when you find your um, romance 
you have the fear of rejection or fear of uh, in, the insecurity of uh, that other person leaving you when you are a young adult you strive because you have the fear of failure if i do not do these a b c d things will i be a failure as a citizen will i not be able to get a good job in life as an adult you have the fear of losing what you have gained already and uh, the fear of losing your dreams because you know that after some time you you have lived your life my dreams are there but i could not achieve my dreams so most likely you would then uh, get your kids to work on your dreams if you look at most of the parents they want they they do they make the kids work on the original dreams that they had i could do swimming back in the day so i'm getting my kid to do swimming i couldn't uh, be a um, singer or a dancer back in the day so i'm getting my kid to do that so when you are an adult fear of losing your dreams is uh, one of the big issues and when you are at that old age uh, say that uh, you are quite close to um, the termination policy you would have fear of death what's going to happen afterwards so then you get into religion because they have the answers like the insurance policy religion is the insurance policy for afterlife so then uh, people at that age uh, tend to seek advice tend to see practices uh, from religions and various uh, doctrines which are available for uh, that and we also discussed of certain inhibitors for happiness remember fear of punishment fear of uh, afterlife fear of criticism by others by the world or self criticism so these are all fears and uh, Uh, what else can we talk about fear so also there's fear there's anxiety disgust loathsomeness and uh, despise they are all quite uh, close cousins of fear if we look at are these fears really innate or acquired like uh, we discussed with the spirits and the vampires you will see that much of our fears are really acquired uh, fears they are not built in fears take for example the fear of uh, of bugs or spiders or ants cockroaches now ants bugs cockroaches they are sometimes food in different parts of the world once when i was um, quite young i tested tested a, not a cockroach but a cricket looking uh, bug uh, you know i was initially afraid to put it uh, inside my mouth it was from a african uh, country but when i really put it inside it was like dried fish so Uh, but i was very afraid to put it because it had this weird uh, tentacles so it's a food in many countries but you could be very afraid of a bug right and uh, if you look at a child in their childhood they are not really afraid of bugs or spiders i remember my my son when he was really young you know when there's an ant or a, a cockroach uh, crawling down the down there Uh, he would just try to grab it and then put put him in, uh, in his mouth or try to smell it or you know play with it so as a child you are not afraid of cockroaches but as and when you grow you develop this disgust toward cockroaches that you don't like that animal anymore in fact that you can get terrified with that animal i know a friend who's very brave she's greatly into adventure sports etc but she's very afraid of snakes you know not not uh, very venomous snakes but the garden snakes she she has that phobia so i was wondering uh, how a very very uh, uh, adventurous person like this can be so afraid of a snake and then when you try to really look back into your past there has been an incident where she has been afraid of a snake actually she was not afraid her caretaker was afraid and then she was making a big fuss so as a young child that person has acquired this fear for snakes and that has imprinted on her and while she is very brave with, with other things of life she is extremely phobic of the snakes so you see that uh, we can acquire fears in fact most of the fears we have have are acquired from our early childhood up until now um there are many cases that i hear personal uh, accounts especially childhood abuse and uh, there there are many stories that i uh, listen to when people come and complain me about their lives but when you really go deep down into their lives it's that they have been very traumatized been very afraid of something which happened in the childhood and that fear is still there 
and they the, the funny thing is that they don't know why that fear came to be the origin of that fear however that fear is basically ruining their daily life their personal lives so that part is there as well if you look into a bit of psychology you also find this thing called the innate behaviors and the learned behaviors um learned behaviors are uh, there's a quite a lot of learned behaviors so one learned behavior is the habituation or desensitization i i will tell you what the habituation is it's basically the decreased response uh, a decrease in the response to a stimulus after repeated presentation so i remember meeting a policeman in sri lanka and i was talking to him and he was telling that sri lanka had a civil war where there was there was a lot of uh, fighting up in the north and uh, there was a threat against this policeman so he was telling me his story that as a young police officer he went into that uh, city and uh, there was this uh, uh, wave during that time those rebellions the 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 terrorist group were killing policemen so this policeman was saying in the beginning he was so afraid he we you know every person passing by he thought that this person is going to kill me somehow with a knife or a pistol or whatever so you can imagine the state of mind he had and then he was telling after 6 months 6 months that it could i could so used to it i didn't even care much so that entire war situation and the fear of death has been normalized so this particular behavior is called the habituation or simply the desensitization we also notice this with our happiness when you are exposed to the same happiness it stops giving you that uh, kick you know that uh, um pleasure that you uh, take out of that is uh, reduced the uh, the returns are diminishing so similarly you have that uh, in fear as well and or behaviors so we have the classical conditioning a classic example for classical conditioning is that um, see all these horror stories they have their soundtracks the creaking squeaky noises that is when the ghost tree really appears or the zombie appears if in fact if you watch a horror movie without the soundtrack you would find it very you know funny if you turn off the soundtrack so uh, the classical conditioning is that a squeaking uh, door or a creaking sound is not necessarily bad you know it's not uh, fearful if we don't have to be afraid of that however we have been conditioned to always associate it with ghosts or a uh, spooky situation so because of that because of that conditioning whenever we hear that we relate it to our emotion there's another thing called the classic uh, conditioning uh, sorry the not the classic condition the operant conditioning operant conditioning is that uh, the other day we discussed about pavlov's dog uh, where we reward or punish the dog and because of that reward or punishment he changes his uh, behavior when we uh, ask him to sit and feed him with a dog uh, treat then he sits and he gets conditioned so that is uh, operant conditioning uh, in fact people who are working you get uh, the same thing you get the same dog training by your bosses through the performance appraisers through the bonuses you get the you get uh, conditioned the same way like that dog gets trained so um, religion uh changes your behaviors your motivations your fears if you take uh, two religions like buddhism and islam what motivates a buddhist and islam it totally depends on the doctrine that you follow and what you fear again depends on your religion so it teaches or it uh, conditions in a operant way uh, our behavior so to put it in short classical conditioning is basically involuntary response to us and a, to a stimulus so there's a involuntary response and a stimulus like a creaking noise squeaky noise operant conditioning is associating a voluntary behavior with a consequence so that's the difference so my question to you is really after telling all these things are we really living a free life or are we just puppets and if we are puppets if for a moment if you think that you've been trained like a dog in your corporate life to be uh, punished or rewarded who's the puppet master is it your boss is it the president is it uh, i don't know the those families the powerful families of the world who's the real puppet master now that's a question that you need to look into
at least uh, if you have reached this stage of self-actualization that's a question that you need to look into so if we look at um, some of the innate behaviors we find that there are apart from these acquired or conditioned behaviors we have innate behaviors sneezing shivering yawning um, taking your hand away from a hot surface blinking your eyes those are all innate we, no one has to teach you it's not conditioned now these days um, it's the season where the turtles the snapping turtles and the red turtles they come out of the uh, come out of their eggs right so you know when they get out of their eggs you don't have to tell them where to go in fact i've been watching a lot of turtles in sri lanka they the turtle parents they come all the way from um, i don't know australia to sri lanka to lay the eggs in the climate uh, warm climate and once the turtles are out the hatchlings are out they just go towards the sea no one has to teach you that the sea is uh, not in that direction it's in this direction they always have that innate sense innate uh, compass of going there you find migratory patterns of the birds you don't need to teach them they have this instinct so there are certain innate behaviors as well a newborn cattle lactating of his uh, udder of the cow you don't have to teach them even a newborn kid you don't have to teach them so similarly we also have innate fears they say that uh, we have the fear of pain you know everyone is uh, afraid naturally innately of the pain we have survival instincts we have the the fear of uh, survival or fear of death uh, for that matter um, now why do we call this innate there's this uh, classic experiment that uh, a scientist did with the ducklings so you take a set of ducklings and then show them a picture of a goose of a mother goose so the gooselings then would be very happy they've been they they were they were looking uh, for the food but if we show if you show them a eagle picture they would be silent they will be afraid now these uh, gooselings newborn but they are still afraid of the eagle picture not even the real eagle the eagle picture and they are very happy to see their goose mother so you see there are certain innate uh, fears that we have and as mammals as human we also have innate fears they say that uh, one of the innate fears that a mammal would have is the fear of snake now it's very interesting if you look at all the religions again from 8000 years to right now if you look at the greek uh, religions uh, apollo is there with the python and uh, in the egypt civilization which is one of the longest civilizations in the world ever period there's uh, neb neb nebuka and ra the god ra and there's a big python nebuka i think and if you look at india there's shiva the lord shiva with his uh, snake called vasuki there's uh, lord buddha at uh, one one week after his enlightenment he's sitting behind or he is sitting in front of a of a giant uh, snake king called muchalinda we find the snake in the bible so you see wherever there is a religion you find the snake in it why because uh, mammals they uh, they are innately afraid of the snake and all these religious leaders they had to conquer this innate fear now that's the symbol there buddha had to sit there to show the world that he does not have that innate fear of the snake Shiva had to have that uh, Vasuki around his neck to show that he is not afraid of the very innate fears a person would normally have. So, snake you will find in all religions, and I will tell you about the snake in the Bible. At the end, I will tell you about that. Uh, that snake uh, who came to came uh, between Adam and Eve and created enmity is called the uh, serpent. he has a particular name i will tell you the name because i want to show you why we call that serpent that particular name so for the mammals mammals or human we have this innate fear of uh, snakes our predators like uh, you know cats birds fire so movie makers are quite interestingly they knowingly or unknowingly they know human psychology that's very fascinating so if you take a movie like a classic movie the hero of the movie is the one who conquers the dragon you know if you take a normal movie the dragon who's a mythical creature is a combination of our innate fears it's a reptile it's a bird 
it's a lion it has fire so it has all our innate fears combined in it so someone who can conquer all these innate fears has to be really the hero so the movie makers know our innate fears and uh, uh, how the fear works but let's see how we uh, um how we respond to fears so like i said uh, there's this always the high road or the low road that we respond to fears but it means uh, in our limbic system in our internal brain chemistry you know the there's this amygdala which is there as a processor and then there's the frontal cortex the frontal cortex is the more advanced thinking one whereas the uh, reptile brain it just executes it doesn't uh, wait it, it is very co- quite quite responsive and fast uh, the frontal lobe and the rest of the cortex is uh, slow compared to the reptile brain you call it the reptile brain because the reptiles only have that part the advantage is that in a situation of fight or flight where you don't have to think a lot if the situation is so demanding you cannot take that uh, time to think a lot reptile brain is active and you take the low road and you just respond you don't think but uh, through various mechanisms people can also try to take the high road like the moral high road you can take the fear high road where you can think about that fear you can r- try to rationalize that fear and then uh, take a rational decision not a reflexive or a um, decision based on uh, the reptile brain now i'll take an example take an example like uh, covid <clears throat> now if we can uh, distinguish between the fear and the risk part of it now risk is the real threat of an occurrence is a statistical um, calculation whereas fear is a psychological phenomena while risk is statistical fear is psychological with the same amount of risk two people can be afraid in two different manners like that uh, garden snake i am not afraid of that garden snake my friend is super phobic of that garden snake so statistically garden snake won't kill both of us but uh, she is very afraid i am not afraid if it had covid everyone was very afraid of covid in the beginning and uh, i checked yesterday it's closer to 800 million people who have uh, disease because of covid um, i feel sorry for them however we have closer to 8 billion people in the world so if you really look at it it's 800 people dead per million people now if you put this in statistics if you leave your fears aside and put this in statistics how big is a million most of the time we don't understand these numbers because we are numbers are very artificial you know we do not understand more than 1 2 3 4 5 6 and 10 you now we don't understand beyond 20 really we don't understand 0.001 we don't understand 10000 i mean we know that it's in our bank accounts and all but we really don't understand it why do i say that to understand a million you can do this quick example quick experiment take a piece of paper a4 paper and then uh, draw 100 dots on it so you draw 100 dots on it and then uh, draw the 100 dots and make it a cluster so you have the dots encircled and you have a circle which contains 100 dots in order to reach million dots you need to draw 10000 circles like that so you you see million is a really big number that we simply cannot fathom we hear million uh, uh, all the time but we simply do not understand that number so if you take 1 minute to draw 100 dots and circle it you will need 10000 minutes to draw a million dots so you see that's a lot of time 10000 minutes is a lot of time we have uh, how many minutes per day we have 60 minutes per hour 24 minutes per a day 24 hours per day so you need 10000 minutes to draw this 1 million and covid has killed eight circles out of this 10000 circles which means there are 9992 circles which are still remaining so you see your chances of dying because of covid is really low but when covid came people were uncertain what's the death rate of covid going to be and even after some time when it was uh, fairly disclosed that the death rate of covid is going to be somewhere around that 800 to 
1,500 per million. People were still afraid because still they could not fathom the number of million. So if you try to put it, make it very rational, maybe you can take the high road instead of taking the low road in responding to fear. So uh, I'll give you another quick example to visualize. Now Canada has 38 million people. If I can select random 38 people for you from all over Canada, from PI Islands, from Alberta, Vancouver, Ottawa, wherever, I select 38 random people and uh, I present them to you. And if all these 38 people are known to you, then that's the same uh, amount of uh, probability that you could die of COVID. Does that make sense now? If, I, if you put it in statistics, which are more relatable. So Canada has 38 million people. I select random 38 people from all over the Canada, from out of these 38 million people. And I present them to you. And all of them have to be known people to you. If uh, that's the same amount of probability that COVID can kill you. Now, having said that, of course, COVID can kill you more if uh, you belong into a certain age category or if you have an existing condition. However, what I want to say here is that there's a way to overcome fear is through rationalizing fear. How do we rationalize? By using statistics, by really looking at it more objectively, leaving that psychological fear behind. However, I will also say a small flaw in that our statistics, our statistical models are based on our knowledge that we acquire, which could jolly well be a wrong uh, uh, hypothesis to start with. So that is there. But more importantly, what feeds fear? Now, I will try to quickly finish this off by telling what feeds fear. Information is the key contributor to fear. There's this is uh, Nazi Joseph Goebbels, who was, a, who was the media person of the Nazi army. He said, repetition makes facts seem more true, regardless of whether it's true or not. So that's a Goebbels theory, right? So if you keep on telling uh, on information channels like news or your Facebook or Twitter feed that something is bad, you are going to get convinced that it is really bad and then you should be afraid of it. So you see, uh, we are bombarded with a lot of information and all this information are not really true, one thing, and most of this information comes with an agenda. Classic example, you listen to Fox News, there's one story. You listen to CNN, there's a whole different story. So you don't know which story is the correct one. But the Buddhism for daily life teaches you that there's always two sides to it. You know, you should take a balance of probability this time. Not be only looking at one singularity, but understand the world is dualistic in nature. So we look at both. And then we try to come into a conclusion uh, considering both those. But then that is not what real Buddhism says. Buddhism does not want you to take conclusions or make conclusions. It only wants you to merely observe, not make conclusions. Because you have been making conclusions all your life. That is how you have your innate fears. You thought that this bug or this cockroach or this garden snake is someone that I should be afraid of. But uh, it's not the case. I, most of us thought that COVID is something that we should be afraid of. Of course, you should be afraid of. But where is that fear now? Is anyone afraid of COVID now? No more. So, um, the other way that fear can be fed or fear can uh, develop is through narratives. Um, if you look at uh, all the narratives people give, especially credible people, people like clergy, politicians, presidents, ministers, you know, spokesmen, opinion leaders, uh, when they give these credible stories, you tend to believe them and they can make you afraid or not afraid of real threat. They, they are, again, if you look into movies, you find all this uh, irony uh, through the conspiracy theories. You know, something you should be really afraid of, they convince you that you should not be afraid of. And something that you don't have to be afraid of, they make you afraid of uh, that thing. Not afraid of that thing. So. Um, conspiracy theories, movies teach you how narratives can change our fear. And uh, if these concepts that they feed are very relatable also, if they are not too far away, but they are very relatable concepts, then also we can be easily uh, acquiring our fear, constructing our fear. But how does the fear cease? 
of course we saw that habituation or desensitization ceases the fear but uh, you know the same way that information feeds fear or narratives feed fear that could also be used to cease the uh, oh, oh sorry the same way the information and narratives feeds the fear it can also make it, to, it can be used to cease the fear how do we do that remember when covid bro broke initially and in ground zero it was all blamed on this little snake um, uh, snake who you know took the covid to a uh, human it broke the human uh, species barrier and because of that snake uh, covid came to us that was a story and after a couple of weeks the story changed well it wasn't a snake it was this uh, other pangolin right the story changed and now imagine we were initially afraid of snakes even touching a snake or snake brushing us eating snake no one likes it but even probably the snake eaters they were afraid of that because covid came from them but then it was the pangolin so you see the narrative change and then uh, your entire fear changes your fear can be ceased be simply by changing the narrative so that's what uh, all these conspiracy things are there there are whistle blowers they come out and say well this is what you should be really uh, be afraid of not this there's another way to cease fear like in the in a game of cards love always trumps fear imagine a mother or a couple you know a mother would do anything out of her fear to save the kid because love is more powerful than fear it's actually in a in a it's in a uh, a, a continuous tug of war love and fear pleasure and fear they are in a continuous tug of war a couple like romeo and juliet their love was more strong so they were leaning towards letting go of that fear however some couples Uh, love is not big enough uh, or powerful enough to contain that fear so the fear becomes more and they separate so that happens peer pressure peer pressure is there because you have your ego to protect now uh, losing or the fear of losing your ego or getting your ego shattered is more than some other fear so you could jump into a, a pool or a or a deep end of the pool because of the peer pressure and the ego there's also the return on the investment that we calculate inside our mind classic example the survivor uh, television series it's a real uh, real life uh, um, it's uh, what do you call that uh, it's a real uh, um, tv series where there are these people who are stranded in an island they have a prize money of 1 million dollars uh, and to that they do various things that they wouldn't usually do so you can overcome your fear if the reward is high if the pleasure is high you would overcome your fear so this fear is not there to stay forever that's the more important message you have your fears right now but you know with the change of the narrative with the change of the information with the change of uh, a different emotion like love or return reward your fear can be changed um but the more important question is is there a more conscious way to overcome fear so now fear is being outside the comfort zone comfort zones are culturally acquired most of the time knowledge uh, knowledge is that the, the the culturally acquired knowledge based psychological zones are the comfort zones comfort zone is in the assumption of certainty predictability control however what is really certain in this world do we have full control in this world we discussed that earlier and uh, if it's not my loss i don't have fear you know fear is always always about losing something which belongs to me so fear is a fabrication of mind very similar to the pleasure in fact there's a sutra the uh, uh, exposition called baya sutra baya means fear in the anguttara nikaya fear is another form of desire or what it says is fear is synonymous with desire bayanti bikkave kamana kamana metam adivachana which means fear is synonymous with desire so in order to really let go of fear you have to let go of your desire 
Now it's easy to say, and uh, I told you that I will uh, tell what's the name of that snake you find in the Bible. It's the cunning snake of temptation. And uh, when the Messiah comes, he would crush the head of that snake of temptation, and that is how you overcome the fear of the snake. So you see, all the religions they point us to somewhat the same direction that uh, it's a lot to do with temptation and desire, and as a byproduct of that. opposite side of the coin we have fear so what we do is we always try to find temporary shelter temporary refuge temporary solace by changing the narrative changing the story or putting love substituting love where there's fear that's what we do but we don't really understand why fear comes into uh, us in the first place so um now all i've been saying so far i've been quoting certain things out of books out of various religions various uh, you know science etc but uh, personally i think uh, quoting something out of book is not going to do you any good it has to be really my experience that something i have personally figured out so me being an adrenaline junkie that i've been uh, doing various uh, adventurous sports you know very uh, dangerous uh, sports and i was also an entrepreneur for most of my life so i am naturally a risk seeker so i am uh, uh, more of a thrill seeking risk taking person but however in my life i have been quite close to death you know it's quite uh, amazing that i am still alive twice in my life people have been trying to literally kill me <laughs> you know literally not uh, not for jokes they were trying to kill me and i remember the first time when i was young when i was at university there was this guy uh, who was very um, uh, very uh, powerful in in sri lanka um, uh, he was engaged uh, with a girl and i came in the middle and then uh, that girl started liking me and then this guy wanted to kill me <laughs> and uh, you know fair enough and then i remember during that time that uh, he has in fact uh, damaged my vehicle sent a note saying that he is going to kill me etc I remember that uh, whenever I would walk on the street, I would be afraid like that policeman, if someone is going to come and kill me. So I understand the fear of uh, death very well. And then uh, after a long time back, after a long time afterwards, a person really came and uh, a crazy person came and tried to stab me. He actually uh, did succeed in stabbing me. Um, I have a cut here, a few stitches. but the second time i was more aware i remember that uh, this person was trying to really stab me with a knife and i felt so calm inside you know while he was uh, trying to stab me his uh, finger came in front of my mouth and i was thinking should i bite it or not bite it if i bite it it's going to hurt him so i probably might not bite it and i was like in a movie struggling with him with his knife and uh, he's trying to kill me so conquering fear is not impossible it's a possible thing right so leave all these books and sutras and expositions you can really do it and uh, there's a way that you can do it so uh, i've been close to death while i was trying to surf a couple of times in uh, in indonesia in a beach called nusa dua um, i got carried away from a rip current in uh, phuket thailand so i've been very close to death many times but this one thing that i always took out from those incident that uh, whenever you are afraid because of the suspense that this particular event could occur that is more uh, that is more how to say that is more uh, it's it's a bad feeling than the actual incident so the suspense is the bad part the real incident is not that bad now why i say that now i knew this guy was going to kill me uh but the actual incident you know it's very simple my 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 uh, scratches although he was trying to kill me it was just a scratch it got healed in less than a week so the actual incident is no different to you scraping your um you know body skin uh, against a branch it's no different to that but the build up to that could be difficult so if you really look at uh, the incident versus the psychological pain that you see that the real physical incident is no more than a scratch but the psychological pain can be much more so whenever i see people who are in fear 
I try to tell them this that it's psychological but uh, I know it's not uh, easy uh, as uh, you know it's easier said than done but uh, believe me you can do that so it's not impossible it's not an impossible thing but uh, what's more important is that in order to let go of your fear you also need to let go of your desire I remember my journey to become a monk where I let go of my physical belongings not only my physical belongings my sentimental belongings I was a great fan of uh, taking photographs and I had a huge collection of wildlife photography and I remember when I was going to become a monk I just clicked a button and deleted all that uh, gigabytes of photography so you can let go of your physical attachments as well as emotional sentimental attachments and the moment you do that you are afraid uh, even if your life your computer but because when you don't own anything uh, you cannot lose anything remember I also said only when you get married you can get divorced only when you own something you can be afraid of the loss be it your physical property be it your emotional property be it your own self so that's another message that you can take out of this so what we've been discussing today is that uh, the fear has a lot to do with I, me, mind, the concept of me. And we also discussed that me or mind is quite linked to the controllability we have. In fact, uh, the René Descartes, one of the, one of the great philosophers, uh, he, he has done a lot of his skepticism. He wrote his book and uh, he says that I can doubt everything in my life but the one single thing I cannot doubt is that existence of me and he finished his book saying therefore I am you can doubt everything in your life whether you know what I feel is right or wrong if I'm really dreaming or if I'm awake but the one thing that you cannot deny is the existence of me so Buddhism actually starts around that concept is this feeling of sense your ego, me, mine. How real is that? Now, it does not simply give an answer that saying that it's unreal, but it only raises the question, how real is that? Do you really have control? When you have control, you call it mine. So, are you really uh, a mind who's in control? And the second part of it is that I discussed in length with happiness, with anger, with fear, that it's a big fabrication I'm not saying that the feelings are irrelevant or they are not true but the build up the feeling itself it's a construct it's constructed a fabrication and it could be very far from reality you know if you look at all these emotions that you find it can be far from what is uh, real why because we have a flawed equipment and the knowledge uh, stemming from that uh, flawed equipment so with the feelings are we really re living the reality or for the analogy sake can i say that we are really living a dream i'm not saying the the life is a dream but I'm, what i'm trying to say is that life is not so real as you think also so when the life or the emotions are not so real i mean of course they are fabricated they, are, they could be far from reality all these worries you have all this physical and all this mental suffering you have can you really validate it? Is the worry that you have worth it based on this dreaminess or the dream uh, feelings, feelings which are like a dream? So that's the question that I'm leaving for you to think about, to ponder. And uh, again, like I said, theory is this, but more important thing is practice. Everything you learn can be vanished the moment that someone is coming out with that knife or when you are you know uh, going downhill without brakes on a steep hill or when you're drowning in a sea which is ocean which is uh, huge so all your fears can uh, uh, you think you could conquer it in in paper on paper theoretically but the real experiment real practice uh, is in the real life so with that I'm going to stop the discussion for today and what we are going to do next week on the seventh day is uh, open the forum to question and answers but before that I will tell you a bit of 
what we can do in the short run and the long run as a practice. I'm not going to talk about meditation or anything here, but I will just uh, give you a few, a few uh, hints and uh, tips. However, if you follow the entire series of discussion on uh, applying Buddhism to daily life, I spoke of mainly two things. The conceptual, fabricated, constructed nature of our feelings and how these feelings are associated to me, mine and I. So with that, I will end the discussion for today. So be ready with all your questions and I wish you good evening and a happy Easter. May the triple gem bless you. Thiruvan Sarnai.